Good morning. We welcome you to Chesterton United Methodist Church on this beautiful, cold, but beautiful Sunday morning, our last Sunday in January. Pastor Heather is on vacation this week, so please keep her in your prayers uh, as she does some renewal time. We have a young and upcoming, up-and-coming preacher, Mr. Terry Rahain, um, who uh, uh, I think you'll like him. Uh, he will be, Terry will be giving our message today. Uh, it's going to be, once again, a, a beautiful Sunday. Uh, we welcome those of you that are here with us in this warm, beautiful sanctuary. We also welcome those of you that are going to join us from home uh, in the rebroadcast of this on YouTube. And once again, if you, if you get a chance and you want to watch it again, go on our YouTube channel uh, and see those things for us. So uh, sit back and find some meaningful worship this morning uh, as we begin. Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand and join me if you're able for the um, call to worship? God, our creator, we call you father, mother, author of life. Draw us closer to you, O oh God. Christ, our savior, we call you the son, the Messiah, the one who saves. Draw us closer to you. Holy Spirit, we call you the advocate, the inspirer, breath, and wind of God. Draw us closer to you, O God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Draw us closer to you, O God. Draw, Draw us in, Spirit, Spirit Christ, Christ, and Creator that we might journey with you more fully and deeply in this life and beyond. Amen.
our scripture lesson today comes from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 31 from the message. One day on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic and with her fortune telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, these men are working for the most high God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul, finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her. Out in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with the accusation. These men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators, subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered, every door flew open, all the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him. Don't do that, we're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, put your entire trust in the master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live and everyone in your house included.
Hey, where are you going? That's what you get for asking the question. Uh, I'd like to invite Pete Swenson to come up. He has a very wonderful announcement for us. Good morning. Hey, in the fall, we had uh, uh, big discussions downstairs about what, you know, what are we going to do for the future of the church. And one of the things that was identified that we really want to get a good uh, program that has a lot of continuity from young age up to young adults in our church. And there was a lot of talk and prayers and discussion about that. Well, good news is our prayers have been answered. And we have found someone to fill the newly created position. It's a full-time position, Director of Family Ministries. Her name is Melissa Humphrey. Melissa, her husband, and twin sons are from the Portage area. Uh, just some of her experiences, so you have a little bit of background information ahead of time. Uh, she has a teaching license, K through six. Uh, she has seven years as uh, uh, experience as a social worker for the Indiana Department of Child Services, working with uh, high-risk youth. Uh, she has five plus uh, years experience as a worship leader. Uh, her and her husband both are musically inclined. How about that? For even better. Be yeah, she's going to be busy. So. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So. Um, she also has uh, quite a bit of experience as a scouting leader, both for boys and girls. Can we say boys and girls anymore? I don't know. But anyway, she's going to start her new position on the 13th of February. So please uh, be here to welcome her. Hopefully we'll have some donuts and coffee or something to, uh, to get people in. But things are happening. Things were, are moving forward. So God is at work. Thank you for uh, leading us in our uh, liturgy this morning. Um, George, thanks for lighting the candles. Thank you, the, the unknown, the unseen up there who make it all happen. Thank you for uh, the computer and uh, sound technicians that uh, make this all possible. And choir, uh, you can go sit down here. I'd, I'd rather look at you than to have you throwing darts at my back. You won't? Okay. Oh, you need to, okay. Well, I'm the old pastor uh, of this church. It was a long time ago. In fact, I've been retired longer than I was pastor, so time passes. Um, in my retirement, I've had more time to read the Bible and study it than I did when I was in the pulpit. So. Um, I had this question in mind, uh, what does the Bible say? Is, uh, what is God trying to tell us? Is there a, a universal theme throughout the Bible that uh, carries on through all the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? And so I've had time to, to look at that and I came to a conclusion and uh, I'll see what conclusion you come to after this morning. But. <clears throat> um, there's some wonderful stories in the Bible, and I would encourage you to read those stories, especially the ones that are biographies <clears throat> about uh, Daniel, um, Moses, um, Rahab the harlot, um, Esther. Um, wonderful stories. You know, you don't you don't have to go far to find wonderful drama in the Bible. And um, so I'm just going to draw on a few. You can't. You don't want to be here all day uh, to go through the whole Bible, so uh, I'll just pick a few. How does God speak to us? Well, he um, speaks to us in a variety of ways. He does speak through his word, the Bible. 
and uh, sometimes he speaks through other people. Uh, have you ever had somebody uh, say something that you thought, that, that got my attention, that's important to hear, and that may be God speaking to you through somebody else. And then sometimes God speaks to us directly. Downstairs, I didn't, I don't know why I mentioned it, but I just mentioned something about, I, I guess it was after the reading of the scripture um, that I said, uh, I didn't know that the prisoners at uh, Indiana State Prison would have obeyed as well as the, the ones here. And afterwards, a gentleman, uh, Roger Abraham, came up to me and he said, uh, are you involved in prison ministry? I said, yeah. And uh, he used to work there as a HVAC person. And uh, so I've got him on my list. When we open up or are able to go back into prison, he wants to be a part of the Kairos prison ministry. Now, just a word I said created that conversation and made that connection. Now, I, I wasn't even paying attention, but that's the way God works. So anyhow... Um, God knows what he has in mind, and, and he tries to communicate that to us in a variety of ways. Dr. Martin Luther King uh, captured the truth that trusting God is important. Here's this quote. There is so much frustration in the world because we have relied on gods other than God. We have genuflected before the God of science only to discover it has given us the atomic bomb. We have worshipped the God of pleasure only to discover that thrills play out and sensations are short-lived and may be followed by a headache the next day. We have bowed before the God of money only to learn that there are such things as love and friendship that money can't buy. And we've learned that in a world of possible depressions, inflations, uh, bank collapses, stock market drops, that money is a, an undependable kind of God to worship. These transitory gods are not able to save us or to bring happiness to the human heart. Only God is able. It is faith in him that we must rediscover. That's Dr. Martin Luther King, and I say a hearty amen to what he just said. And that, I believe, is the crucial message of the Bible. God has given us his word, however we have received it, and he would like us to believe it, to act on it, and hopefully find his blessings. Let's uh, begin with Bible stories. The first uh, is one you all know of uh, Adam and Eve. Um, <clears throat> God placed Adam and Eve in a garden complete with everything they wanted. And he only gave them one rule. <clears throat> he says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And um, they worshiped the snake instead of God. And you know what happened. So what is the message of that story? Uh, let's look at uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, Noah. Uh, there's a story of Noah and um, uh, let me read this first. Um, in Genesis six, it says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of humanity had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was always only evil. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Why did Noah find favor? Because the scripture says he was righteous. Righteous isn't a word we hear much today, but it has to do with being trust, trusting, being trustworthy, 
uh, being upright and holy, being uh, obedient and faithful. I just think about Noah. When, when this word came to Noah that he's to build an ark, you know, uh, the carpenters' union was on strike. There were supply chain uh, problems getting lumber. And I'm sure he wanted to ask at some point, Lord, can't the ark be a little smaller? That's, it's huge. And I'm, I'm building it on dry land. There's no lake, no river, no ocean, even close to this. How, how are you going to get it to the water? Can't you just see Noah scratching his head and wonder, what in the world is the Lord up to? And that's true. Sometimes when he speaks to us, it doesn't make any sense. But he's the Lord. And Noah was obedient. And we're here today because of Noah. Wow. Then there's Abraham. We all uh, remember Abraham and Sarah's faithfulness, <clears throat> except it, it faltered a little uh, when God said he was going to create a, a nation that was going to be as plentiful as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. Um, Abraham was, I don't know what age, but thought, well, I better get busy. And so they engaged Hagar uh, to start a family. But that wasn't God's plan. And uh, in spite of that disobedience, uh, you know, when Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90, they conceived and had Isaac. Well, that's, that's one story of faith, but the one that really gets me is, so they have this child. And then God says to Abraham, take him out in the desert, kill him, sacrifice him, make him an offering to me. And as they're walking out, even Isaac asked his father, Where, where's the animal that we're going to slay? And Abraham believes, and he says, God will provide. And sure enough, a ram caught in a thicket becomes the sacrifice, and Isaac is spared. What faith? There are other uh, Old Testament characters that, that we could look at. Um, Moses, a murderer who becomes the leader of a nation. Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, Ruth. What do we learn from those stories? Read them and, and see what conclusion you would come from those stories. And now I'd like to focus on one particular Old Testament character that uh, wasn't in our scripture today, but it's about King Saul. King Saul tried to be uh, a good king, an obedient king. Um, but like us, he was flawed. God was uh, faithful to Israel, helping them win uh, battles over their enemies. And uh, God is one who gets revenge um, for our sake, I guess. And the Amalekites had ambushed Israel on their trek up from Egypt to the Holy Land. And God wanted to get revenge against the Amalekites. And so he told Saul, I want you to declare a war against the Amalekites and I want you to wipe them out. Men, women, children, and all their animals spare nothing and take no spoil. Well, God gave Saul the victory over the Amalekites and um, then Saul had an idea and to me the idea makes sense. God gave Saul the victory and so Saul's thinking, gee, it would be nice to thank God with an offering. And so Saul kept back some of the prime animals to make an offering to God. 
that's not what God asked. And so here's what the scripture says. I'm sorry I ever made King Saul. He turned his back on me. He refuses to do what I tell him, for rebellion is like the sin of divination. And arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, I have rejected you as king. Wow. Those are strong words. Because he took a few animals and made a sacrifice. He didn't do what God asked him to do. I, I fear that in our day and age, and probably for all history, uh, we recreate God in our own image and think, um, you know, I can fudge a little bit here, a little bit there. God is gracious, he's good, he's loving. He'll, he'll forgive, it's okay. But we've forgotten that God is sovereign. He's the Lord of the universe. He's created, you know, we've just put James Webb telescope out there to see if we can see the end of the universe that God has created. And here we are on this big blue marble and you look at the marble and you think, who am I? One individual among billions and God knows me and God loves me and God created me. Who am I to question God? He is Lord, he is master, he is sovereign. But yet, we forget who he is. That's why it's good to take time daily to refresh our mind with scripture, with devotions, with remembering who he is and who we are. Well, let's move to the New Testament. Bartimaeus was born blind. Can you imagine that? Close your eyes and be blind for a while. Jesus happened by where Bartimaeus was, <clears throat> um, knew his condition, said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Strange request. Mart Bartimaeus did. And when people questioned him, here's what he said. The man they called Jesus, he didn't even know who the man was. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. He did exactly what Jesus told him. Would I do that? I don't know. Then there's the prodigal. You know the story well. He took his inheritance and spent it on wild living and then when the money ran out and he was threadbare and cold and hungry, he came to himself. That's a, that's a good word. Come to yourself. Come to uh, wisdom. Come to an understanding of uh, where you went wrong. He said, I will return to my father and I will ask him if I could be just one of his servants because they have shelter, they have food, they have clothing, they're well taken care of. That's all he wanted. But he, he went home, he confessed his sin, he said, I've sinned against you, Father, I've sinned against God. Make me as one of your servants. And what did the Father do? Opened his arms and welcomed him home. Took the signet ring and put on his finger. Put a robe over his shoulders. Welcome home, son. What does that teach us? It teaches us about grace, but it also teaches us about the need for confession, acknowledging who we are, what our need is, and who God is. Wherever Jesus went, he seemed to draw a crowd. One day he was... Uh, <laughs> needing to be alone, like Heather on vacation. 
He went to a lonely place, but the crowd saw him and they followed him. Pretty soon, 5,000 people were gathered to hear him preach. And so he obliged and they heard him and then the sun was beginning to set and he realized they would be hungry before they got home. And so he told the disciples, get, get food for these people. And the disciples said, are you crazy? 5,000 people? We don't have any food out here. So Jesus disregarded them and he, he found this lad that had five loaves and two fish. He said, can I use these? What did the lad say? Sure. Twelve baskets full of leftovers. Wow. So what do we learn from these stories? There's a story that uh, Susan read for us about Paul and Silas singing in the middle of the night because they were in jail. And then the earthquake, releasing all the bars and the doors. Paul and Silas says, don't leave. Nobody get out. And it so impressed the jailer, he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas baptized him and, and his family because of their faith. The Ten Commandments are still uh, the rules for righteousness and justice in our world. But I think, uh, I think back during the time I was your pastor, I don't know that I could have quoted the Ten Commandments. Any of you that can quote all ten of them? Has anybody ever told a lie? Has, has anybody ever taken something that wasn't theirs? Has anybody ever used God's name in vain? Has anybody lusted for anybody else? Jesus said, if you lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. So we shouldn't forget those commandments. They're not 10 suggestions. And even though we know we'll fail, that's the ideal. That's what God wants of us, at least to try and to admit when we fail. The reason is that there are consequences to sin. My daughter is, um, um, she, she looks after international exchange students while they're here in the States in the Arizona area. And um, she had to do a, an unpleasant task. Um, a girl from Spain who was only 14 years old, I don't know how she got in the program, but apparently in her culture it was okay to drink and she drank, which was against the rules of the exchange program. Jenny had to go and take her back to the airport and fly her back to Spain because she disobeyed. It was a tough thing for everybody. Years ago, um, I was pastor at Salem Chapel in LaPorte County and there was a gentleman there and I may have told you the story before, but uh, his name is Charlie Dye. He and his wife Pauline came up from Tennessee during the depression, they were poor as church mice. And he started a plumbing business out of the back of his car and grew it into residential, commercial, and industrial divisions. And Charlie was well off. But Charlie was also a dedicated Christian. And he said um, he was riding in the back seat of a car um, and he was driving past uh, the front of the courthouse in downtown Laporte and he saw a gentleman seated on the wall there and somehow his heart went out to him he heard this still small voice, this whisper, that told him that man was in need. And so Charlie told the driver to stop the car. And he did, and Charlie ran out, went over and pressed $20 in the man's hand, 
ran back to the car, got in, and they took off. And this was Charlie's explanation. He said, when God speaks to me, I want to do what he says because I don't want him to stop speaking to me. And I, I think that's pretty powerful advice. So what is the universal theme of the Bible? I think it is trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I don't, let me know what you decide. So uh, you and I are um, modern day disciples. Uh, if you look in your Bible, uh, it, the, the book of Acts tells about the acts of Christians. And um, it stops at uh, chapter 28, I believe. Is that right? Right by? Chapter 28, I think, is the last chapter of Acts. But, but you are chapter 29. The Bible began, but it hasn't been finished because we're modern day disciples and God is still counting on us, counting on you, counting on me to be his disciples today. You may be the only Bible somebody reads. And so live your life in such a way that people see Jesus in you. Make Jesus look good by your life. Don't be hypocritical. Be faithful. That, I believe, is the message of the Bible. Amen.
aware that the flowers are given in celebration of Gary and Deborah Beard's 34th wedding anniversary today. We thank them for sharing those flowers with us today. Pastor Heather is on vacation. Uh, remember her. Um, it's a time of relaxing and renewal. Pray that she comes back refreshed and renewed and ready, ready to take the reins of ministry again. Anyone else have a joy or concern? Will you pray with me? Oh God, we are humbled in your presence. We are amazed at your greatness. When we consider who you are and who we are, what is humanity that you are mindful of us? How is it that we hold your attention when we so glibly live our lives often forgetting and failing to honor you, to love you with all our heart, to do what you want us to do. Forgive us, we pray. Restore a right spirit within us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Open our ears to hear your still small voice, your whisper. Help us to Lift up your name to cause people to wonder what's different because you live in our lives. Remind us that we are the church, not just in the sanctuary, but when we go out in the world. Every day, everywhere, all the time, we are your people, your representatives in the world. People want to know, does the risen Christ make any difference in these people? Is there anything obvious about their lives that would make me want to believe? Help us to be faithful disciples of the Lord. Thank you for honoring us by coming to us as a little babe humiliated in the straw of a manger. And even though you only preached for three years, you've changed the world. We want, wouldn't want to live in a world without the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. John says, you are your word. When we see you, we see God. When we hear you, we hear God. You are the word of life and the light of the world. How blessed we are to be called to be your disciples. We give you thanks for the blessings of life, for anniversaries and birthdays, for the goodness of our life here in these United States of America. We pray that you would bring peace on earth. We don't know what's going to happen in Europe, but we pray that peace might prevail. We pray for those who suffer, those who are lonely, those who are sick, the homeless that are shivering in tents and blankets on the streets of the city. Give us hearts of compassion. Help us to care for those who need your love. Thank you for walking with us, encouraging us day by day. Thank you for the music we have to sing the great hymns of faith that tell about how you were faithful for generations and generations 
and how somehow your message has reached us. Help us not be selfish, but to share it. We give you thanks for the power of prayer, the ability to talk to you, our God, to share our pains and our sorrows, our joys and our celebrations, and to call upon you, especially in our times of need. And now your people are praying together the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a time of announcements. Uh, you got your announcement already. You got it early. Uh, once again, the blessings that God gives us. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, uh, if you'd like to sign up for the newsletter, make sure you go to our website, chestertonumc.org. Contact us. A lot of information on there, and make sure you get the weekly prayer and the weekly newsletter. Uh, we also come to a time of offering, uh, a time to give back for those blessings uh, that we've been giving, the blessing of staff, the blessing of a, fa a full-time family ministry person, um, the blessing to be able to have people in to give us the message when the pastor is away uh, on vacation, the time for pastor to be away on vacation so she can renew. Uh, we are blessed, and as always, you can either bring your gifts. We have a box in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, you can mail it to the church office. You can set up payments online, uh, donations using the giving tab on our website. Um, and remember to, uh, giving is from the heart. It is not a requirement in the church, but it's from the heart because we just can't give back what God has given us.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this building, the people within it, this town, this state, this beautiful world that you've given us to take care of. We can never hope to give back what you've given us. But take these gifts, this blessing, and bless it to be used in your worship and in your name. Amen. Remain standing. Let's sing our final hymn, Trust and Obey. Just a few more stories, if you don't mind. When I was a kid, my father got a newsletter called Now from uh, R.G. Letourneau in Longview, Texas. R.G. Letourneau was a, a motorcycle mechanic. And early on in his work, he decided that uh, he shouldn't just give a tithe to God, that he would take God into partnership. In other words, 50% of what he made was God's and 50% was his. And God blessed him. He made some of the biggest earth-moving equipment you've ever seen. He created what was called the turnipole. And he envisioned a, an electric motor in every wheel on some of his machines, uh, powered by a diesel electric, electric generator. And he could make long trains with these wheels that were 10 feet in diameter and four feet wide that could go across tundra, that could go across snow. And the Army and the United States used these for a while until giant helicopters were able to move things. And so um, I, I just found that fascinating uh, to learn about this man and his faith. 
And then I think um, closer to home, uh, anybody go to Hobby Lobby? You know, they honor God by staying closed on Sunday. Have you seen the lines at Chick-fil-A? They're not doing well. But they honor God to be clothed on, closed on Sunday. So let those be examples that when we trust our almighty Heavenly Father, he can bless, he can do miracles, but we have to act on his behalf. I challenged the kids in the children's sermon downstairs. I said, we talked about faith, what faith means, what faith does. I said, if you believe me, I, I met a man in the kitchen down there. It was Pete Swenson. I said, if you go to Pete and ask him for a dollar, he'll give you a dollar. There were about 12 kids. Three of them went. They came back, we got a dollar, we got a dollar. Because they acted on their faith. May God bless you as you seek to be a faithful follower of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.